Thanks everyone for joining yet another episode in which I talk about issues relating to public transportation. Um, so this is going to be the first uh, stream, not first video upload, I think, but first stream of 2022. Uh, but let's just continue. I mean, it's a Saturday. Um, so uh, the plan is to talk about train scheduling. Uh, but specifically, one issue regarding train scheduling. I'm going to talk about train scheduling issues in general uh, for a bit, but really this is about how you can produce these if you want to talk about how to modernize a railway or if you're proposing to build a railway, like a high-speed railway or something, um, what the schedule should look like um, and uh, how you might want to produce it. Uh, and I do want to warn people that this is going to be a bit jank, and the reason it's going to be about jank is that this involves coding, and my coding skills are not the best. Quite to, to, to quite to the contrary. Um, so, uh, first of all, let's do a recap of how one timetables trains. Um, and I don't mean the specific tools, of, I mean the kind of high-level concepts, just because uh, the tools we're going to use are going to be things we're going to pick in order to support a kind of broader program, and the broader program is integrated timetable. Now, um, integrated timetabling means that you need to plan everything in conjunction. So this means uh, the timetable gets planned at the same time as the infrastructure and the rolling stock. So that's the three legs of this. Uh, I think it's called magic triangle. I've seen that term used. Uh, I think it's from German rail fans who are talking about how to implement how to implement Swiss planning ideas. Uh, and the idea is that there needs to be total coordination in planning of these three things, which are the timetable, the infrastructure, and the rolling stock. The good news, if you're crayoning something, if you're, if you're proposing something, is that it means you can do all of these things at once, and which means that you can just figure out what the needs of the line are and just do everything at once as opposed to have some kind of God-given uh, rolling stock or uh, infrastructure that you just cannot change. Um, and this is actually really good. Uh, now, it does create more work for the planner, um, but it's specifically more work of thinking about how different parts of the system um, work with one another rather than just doing a kind of government by pilot or government by tweak, which is very common in the United States, unfortunately, that everything is uh, tweaks upon tweaks upon tweaks. And if you propose some kind of coordination, then people will stare at you and say, we can't do that. We don't have long-term planning. We don't have regular funding. And this is what we shovel much higher subsidies into these systems than anyone in Northern Europe would ever think appropriate. So, um, what this means, okay, so first of all, when it comes to rolling stock, uh, there's exactly one kind of train that you should ever try running in, uh, Okay, not the okay, so not the Haverhill report, but um, we actually do talk about this in the Haverhill report. So let me show you guys this. Uh, so okay, but we again, what is governed by pilot? Okay, let me say this is a really good question. Um, so the governed by pilot is that um, in the United States there is a very rigid regulatory structure that uh, makes it very hard to make changes. Uh, part of it is formal regulations. Uh, for example, there's this rule called Title VI, which is that essentially everything you change requires um, full-blown analysis to make sure you're not accidentally um, hurting black people and other disadvantaged groups. 
um, the status quo never gets subject to such changes. So this creates a lot of status quo bias. And uh, the escape clause in Title VI is that if you do pilots, I believe, up to six months, then they're exempt from the changes. So you can test something for six months and then say it worked. Um, and, uh, and again, it's not just the regular, it's not just formal regulations like Title VI. It's an entire mentality in which if you propose a change, say, wait, people say, wait, we cannot do it. I mean, 12 studies and more research is not conclusion, more research is needed. And then if you do a six month pilot, you say, yeah, well, let's experiment. So that's that's what I mean by government by pilots. Um, and because pilots tend to only change one thing at a time, it makes it really hard to do this kind of integrated planning. Um, and it's actually really hard. I'm going to talk for a second about the situation in Boston because um, this is the example I'm going to use. Um, essentially, it's how did I write the timetable? So um, we have these line by line appendices. So this is Haverhill. Uh, just as a reminder, you want to go to regionalrail.net, not regina, regionalrail.net, and uh, that auto redirects to the transit matter, to the transit matters regional rail uh, report, which they're very collaborative. I'm not even the lead on this. Um, however, the timetables I wrote. Uh, so let me see if I can find the Worcester line as well, or it's there, or if it's in, okay. Yeah, okay, this is also Worcester. Uh, let's keep saying there's a PDF that's two appendices at once. One is proof of concept, the other is Worcester. Uh, this is just going to be Worcester because I want to show you guys the timetable. Um, so it's current, this is what better trains, better regional rail will do. Um, but I, uh, uh, so this is, so I mean, you can just read, I mean, right now the trains do this in an hour 34. This is local trains, which are very uncommon. I don't think that these trains actually run on weekdays, or maybe they do because of Corona, but this is, so, so this is, I believe something that we specifically took to um, show one pattern. And there's, for example, a nonstop train from South Station, or almost nonstop from Melissa to South Station. So there's maybe an hour or one. And so we showed what a local would be with electrification, which is a little less than an hour. So better than the nonstops. Um, and what we're proposing is an, I mean, you can see the local and express pattern, the parentheses mean doesn't stop, but it passes at this time just to convince people that the timetable works. Um, and we are going to get into this timetable, and because this is one place where the method I'm using is going to be very tank, um, because local express. So anyway, um, when you don't do government by when you do this kind of high-level coordination, First of all, what the rolling stock is, it should always be um, something called electric multiple units. And I know that we've talked about these in the reports, but uh, needed improvements, I think. Um, this might actually be the place where we do not talk much about electrification. So, the, so what you need basically always is to run electric trains and this specific electric train, electric multiple unit it is called emu now this is not a big thing for swiss planners why is it not a big thing for swiss planners because that's been the case for generations i mean not the electric multiple units but, but the so switzerland is the world's only all electrified intercity rail network. Uh, this goes back to World War II. Actually, it's not recent. And the reason is that there were coal shortages in the war. So Switzerland, um, out of necessity, wired everything. Switzerland also uh, has a lot of electricity because it's in the mountains. So the uh, rivers um, have, uh, fall very steeply. So they have a lot of hydro resources. Uh, they didn't even have electric locomotives at the time, so what they did is they wired all of the lines 
and uh, the, and they ran steam locomotives, but with electric heating of the steam rather than coal heating. And then after the war, they got electric locomotives. Um, so that's, again, Switzerland did this in World War II. Uh, nowhere else in Europe has this been done completely. A lot of places in Europe are mostly electrified, but don't go all the way for silly reasons and they should go all the way. Um, like the Netherlands or Belgium, I think Italy is 75% electrified, Sweden. Um, however, Asia exists as well. Uh, nowhere in Asia is 100% electrified unless you count places that don't have mainland rail, like Singapore or Hong Kong, just subways, uh, but uh, or, or very local commuter trains, I guess, the West Rail and East Rail in Hong Kong. But uh, China, South Korea, and India are all planning to go 100% electric in the next couple of years, which is very nice. So you should do this. Um, and the reason you should do this is that electric trains outperform diesels in basically every way imaginable. And, uh, and again, it's not something that the Swiss Magic Triangle thinks about very much because this was done in Switzerland before the Magic Triangle. And it's not something that Germans think about very much because usually the lines where people try to apply the system I'm thinking to are lines where that are not the margin of electrification. When I mean the margin of electrification, I mean um, lines that are uh, that could be either. Um, so it's either lines that are very clearly already electric. Uh, so for example, urban commuter lines, main lines, or lines that have no chance of being electrified soon um, because maybe they're so maybe it's a rural branch line. It runs hourly trains and it's two car trains and they, uh, and this line probably should be electrified, but not now. Uh, and so the margin of electrification, and it exists. I mean, there are electrifying lines in Germany, just not a lot. It's kind of weird here. Um, and, uh, but the multiple unit bit is actually important. Um, so multiple unit control means that you don't have a separate locomotive. Uh, this is actually an American invention because this is controllers and both ends, so that doesn't count. This is actually an invention from the Chicago L. Uh, so what this means is that it's not actually good. I mean, I guess these um, many British things. Um, what's a good pick? Ooh, this is good. This is really good. Um, so this is a commuter train in Japan, um, something called the Shonan Shinjuku line. It is a, uh, so the Shonan Shinjuku line. So as you may have heard about the Yamanote line, Tokyo, the ring line. Let me see if I can find a cool or a cool chart here. Or open rail, if or if open railway now decides that it, it uh, loading is within its dignity. Yeah, okay. Um, so this line in Tokyo uh, is called the Yamanote line. It runs as a ring. I mean, one of the patterns is uh, a ring on this, these two tracks. The Shonen Shinji, um, but there are parallel lines that don't do the ring, so there are a bunch here. This is kind of the more central Tokyo part of the ring. This is uh, so central Tokyo. It's not this. This is Akiba. Uh, if you're Taku, if you're Taku, this is your place. But no, this center is this. This is Tokyo Station. Um, and there's the Yamanote side, which is this one. So there are four tracks here: two are the ring, and two are something called Saikyo and Shonan Shinjuku, which is lines that, in various configurations, go what. Uh, and I'm grossly oversimplifying this, by the way, but this is basically how it's run. And so um, this is uh, so this is the line. And uh, no, not this, not this, not this. I'm proving it. Yeah, okay, here. Uh, so this is the uh, I guess the front of the train. You might notice that there's no locomotive there. Uh, yes, the front of the train. You see the guy, the, the driver. Um, there's no locomotive. Um, each car is its own thing. Now, not all cars have to be self-propelled. Um, in fact, so an American kind of way of doing EMUs is that every car will have motors underneath. 
And uh, usually in Europe and Japan, that's not the case. I mean, sometimes it is, but usually uh, maybe only every other car, car. So the cars all look very similar, but uh, maybe only half of them have traction motors underneath, just because they don't need uh, that much. And the reason you want to do this kind of setting without a separate locomotive uh, is it's just way more efficient this way. Um, again, I talked before about coordination. If you're if you have coordinated rolling stock purchase, you're not in the situation, oh, uh, we have 20-year-old locomotives, but we need to replace the car, so let's replace by coaches. Oh, we have 20-year-old coaches, but the locomotives, uh, 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 oh, but we need to replace the locomotives, let's get the, the locomotives. So you don't, when you don't think that way, when you just know in advance what kind of rolling stock you want, you got this way. Now, Switzerland, unfortunately, still has electric locomotives, but they've been transitioning to all EMUs slowly in the last 20 years. Uh, Japan does this a lot better. Um, essentially, every uh, electrified passenger railway service in Japan is EMUs rather than electric locomotives. Um, the ones that are unelectrified are mostly diesel versions of these, so DMUs, diesel multiple units, rather than diesel locomotives. I believe the only electric locomotives that run in Japan for passenger rather than freight service are the handful of existing night trains, or remaining night trains. Uh, Britain, I believe, is the same. The... Uh, They've been very aggressively into multiple units um, since roughly privatization. Uh, continental Europe is lagging, but we're get, we're heading there. Um, by the way, most of the world's rail ridership is in this, these because every subway is this, every S-Bahn system is this. Um, nearly all high-speed rail is this. So Japan, China, I mean, big two, Germany. Um, the holdouts, the main holdout is France. Um, and most high-speed rail ridership in the world is not in France. Um, so uh, in Switzerland, when they talk about rolling stock um, integration, it's not necessarily this because they've already electrified. Um, so sometimes it's EMUs. The, one of the advantages of EMUs is that um, they accelerate better. Uh, and the reason is that there's something called an adhesion limit and, a, and something called a power limit. So um, I'm going to... Uh, so this is just going to be, this just looks like random math, the code. Um, but what this does is it, uh, what, what this does is it finds, uh, the acceleration time on a train between, uh, uh between two speeds. So it, essentially it's something that computes speeds, speed zones, because if I tell you that the, the train operates at 100 kilometers an hour and there are no slow zones and no stations you can just put in a calculator but what if there's a slow zone what if there's a station what are all these trip times so this is essentially a way to generate this and um the so these are the formulas this put um, and then plugged in with numerical integration you don't need to integrate this numerically you can integrate this exactly it's just i mentioned before not the world's greatest coder uh but um the um but but the way this works is that uh the um acceleration comes from uh in theory three but in practice two factors the two factors in practice are the initial acceleration rate um which is in meters per second squared the number in this is uh m uh, I write this M in this code, so if you execute the code, it will tell you that M is initial acceleration in meters per second square. And the other is K, is this only whole K, which is the power to weight ratio. And the issue is this. Um, when you accelerate, um, I guess you accelerate at rate A, and your current speed is V, um, then if you then it's kind of elementary calculus that um, the uh, power that um, you're using is uh, already proportional to your to your speed because um, kinetic energy is mass times speed squared. I mean that over here, but no, I don't want to buy followers so kindly. So, um, 
the upshot is that uh, your acceleration rate um, is always going to be capped by power to weight divided by speed. So let's say your uh, um, uh, so so let's say that you are uh, the next generation German train. Uh, then your power to weight ratio is twenty point seven, which by the way, I mean you can do a lot better. So this is what they do in Japan. Um, the Spanish trains, which are not EMUs, the Spanish trains are uh, the Talgo system is incredibly light. Uh, so the Talco of Real actually is maybe a little bit more than this. I think it's 27 point something. Um, so let's, but, uh, but, but the more conventional trains in Europe would be, used to be very high teens, now they're low 20s, like maybe 20 to 23. So if you're this, what this means is that um, if your speed is, let's say, twice this, so 20.7, that's, 41.4, and this is in uh, SI units, this is meters per second, so in human terminology, it would be 149 kilometers an hour. In that case, your acceleration rate is capped by, well, remember, this is 41.4 meters per second, and we're capped by power to weight ratio divided by speed. So this is our speed divide, and then power to weight ratio, so we're capped by 0.5. Now, this doesn't matter usually because very few trains that are high speed can even accelerate faster than this. I mean, the more recent ones can because they realize it's useful. Um, but usually it's 0 0.4, 0 0.5. Um, and the point of a, so electrification lets you have much higher power. I mean, there are many other benefits of electrification, but electrification gives you much higher power. So this is where these very high numbers come from. Um, which, again, do not require electrification. Uh, sorry, they do require electrification, but they do not require multiple unit control. The French trains are not multiple units, and the and the, and the touch of a G is, I think, 23. Um, but then you have the initial acceleration issue, and this is not about power. This is, um, this is about adhesion. What matters at low speed is, is not this. I mean, the, I mean, think about it. Um, Let's say my power to weight ratio is again, let's say 20.7, and my speed is half that. So 10.35, which is 37 kilometers per hour. This doesn't mean that I'm accelerating at 20.7 by this. It doesn't mean that I'm accelerating at 2 meters per second squared. Like there's a maximum practice effort, it's called, with the, the maximum uh, acceleration rate. And again, there's also. I, I, so, uh, as I said, there are three numbers, and I'm only mentioning two, and the reason is that, when, is that on modern trains, the third thing, which is another adhesion limit, is dead letter. But um, uh, but usually you have a, so your power, so there's power limit, and there's adhesion limit. And this number, the initial acceleration, uh, depends on the proportion of the train's mass that is supported on driven axles. So um, the best thing for it is if you, every single wheel is driven. And if you have good motors and every single wheel is driven, you can get up to maybe two meters per second squared, which is much higher than you will ever do in practice because of passenger comfort um, and, pass and standing passenger safety issues. So you usually will cap at 1.3. Um, and this is one of the reasons that European EMUs don't actually uh, motorize every train. Uh, I'm sorry, motorize every car. Um, maybe half the axles will be motorized because you can get on a train designed for regional performance uh, initial acceleration of about 1.25 or 1.3, which is already the passenger, the limit for, for passenger safety. Uh, and the and, and beyond that, it's not really necessary. And in Japan, on the commuter trains, they just motorize maybe again about half the cars just to keep the trains light and cheap. So there are all, always other concerns than just real performance. Uh, and um, so the uh, but but bear in mind that first of all we might have motors that are optimized for other things. 
So you might have things that are even well below your 1.3 limit. So even the N700, which is a Shinkansen design where all the axles are uh, motorized, is only 0 0.9, and that's a new doll. Uh, this is half the axles are motorized. Um, and so the so, so these are essentially our options. And bear in mind, if you use electric locomotives, start from 0 0.4 and go down from that. Um, and this is one of the main reasons you want to do that. You so so you want to do all EMU. Um, modern places are transitioning toward it, or already have done so. Uh, so again, just requires thinking and, and thinking about what you're doing. And 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 uh, the one thing to add is also that there's an issue of platform length to think of. Um, and in Switzerland, the so Switzerland is very fond of bilateral trains. One of the so. In Switzerland, when they did the magic triangle, uh, this included specifically getting bi-level trains on the intercity lines because they were limited by platform length. And uh, they did not want to lengthen all of the platforms because it was not just lengthening the platforms at, let's say, Zurich and Basel and Bern, but at so many intermediate stations and so many outlying cities because it's all about a connected network. So this is why they... Uh, so this is why they did. Uh, uh, so this is why they did by levels. Now I don't think most places should be running by levels. Um, actually, I have a blog post about this, which has the very subtle title: "Can you run by level?" Uh, essentially, it, yeah, this one. Uh, and the reason, and, and essentially, it's, um, and essentially what. The issue is that if you're doing big urban commuter rail, a what Switzerland does not have because all of the cities are small, um, then you're going to be limited by um, not necessarily platform length, but by passenger egress. And it's much slower for passengers to egress the to, to get out of the train if it's by level, even if you do really weird things that they're doing in Paris to try to speed it up. Now, if you're Switzerland, you don't care because in Switzerland, all the major stations are terminals. They have a enormous number of tracks the train can just stay uh, and the train's going to be sitting there for a couple of minutes anyway for the transfers so yeah if it takes if the train dwells seven minutes at a, at a major station cost of doing business now it's the bourbon station just 30 seconds but suburban station is not very busy um but the major station yeah five minutes seven minutes um and in japan because it's all single levels um and the trains are designed around better egress on the shinkansen uh, the dwell time at Osaka is one minute. At Chino Osaka for the three trains. Um, and, Osa and everyone talks about Tokyo, but just as a reminder, Osaka, Metropolitan Osaka, which is also Kobe and, uh, and Kyoto, has 18 -ish million people, which makes it comfortably larger than any European city. It would be about even with Los Angeles uh, in the United States. So... This is, so, so being able to uh, exchange passengers in uh, in a manner is not um, is not playing an easy mode, let's just say. And so, so that's the main advantage of single levels. Um, so you might want to think in advance: what do you do? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So in the uh, wait, no, not the E two series. E, you mean E one and E four? E two is single is the single level that used to run uh, on the uh, trains north of Tokyo, the Tokyo Shinkansen. Um, E1 and E4, um, so it used to be E2 and then I believe E3 or the mini Shinkansen that are attached to it, and then they were replaced by E5 and E6s that are attached to a mini Shinkansen. The bi-levels are E1 and E4, I believe. Um, but yes, so they did try to run bi-level Shinkansen, Instead of 1,300 passengers, they had space for 1,600, but the trains were kind of jank. Um, well, one of the problems is that bi-levels, you can have bi-level EMUs, but a lot of the advantage of bi-levels uh, is reduced if you're running EMUs rather than uh, rather than uh, locomotives because the uh, equipment, for because the motor equipment for the train is going to conflict with the uh, is going to conflict with the seats, so you're not actually going to gain as many seats as you would like. 
And uh, so it's, yeah, 1.3, which is 1.6 miles on in Japan, the Shinkansen. Um, and the problem is that uh, you're taking a huge hit to egress, which is really important on the busiest systems, which is why... Um, the which is why in Japan they don't do by levels and on, on the really busy urban commuter lines. I mean, if they do a by level, it's going to be one car per train or something. It's going to be a green car, so the it's first class, um, because their uh, seating is more important. So getting so squeezing more seats is useful. You're not going to have a lot of standees because the whole point of the green car is higher levels of comfort. So you're going to price it so that. Uh, you're not going to have standees, so the car is going to be emptier, so it can unload faster as well. But the normal cars are all uh, single level in Tokyo. And again, and, and it brings up that they have uh, by level green cars to point out that it's not because they can't do some kind of uh, uh, clearance limitation. So in Britain, they don't have by levels because uh, in Britain, the clearances are tiny. They tried to do by levels and it just did not work. They, they did not have the space for it. Um, it's also true on the RRB in Paris. Uh, it's the one line with somewhat reasonable egress at rush hour, not because they want to, but because they uh, didn't have the clearances, the, the, the loading gauge for bi levels. They're, they're trying to do bi levels right now anyway. They're, I think the trains are buying it for bi level. Up until now, they were single level because of tunnel height limitations. Um, but in Tokyo, it's not like that. In Tokyo, um, they have the clearance for by levels. They just choose not to use them because they're just not very good for um, very high density operations. Now, if you're not literally Tokyo, you're not Tokyo. Okay, so I mean, again, think what your use case is. Are you trying to optimize for egress if you're a very large city, which is not just Tokyo, New York? Um, if you're doing the kind of through service, so um, Philadelphia with its central, so, so is open railway really on yes. Um, so in the uh, so in Europe we have these Theron uh, S-Bahn systems like in Berlin or in Hamburg or in Paris where it's called the RER and Paris they do try to run by levels on it as long as success um, in the United States they only do that in Philadelphia and let me see if they can actually yeah. so in Philadelphia it's a very jank looking system uh, where the where they had this is the Pennsylvania Railroad side so trains would go whoop and whoop and whoop and then there's the Reading Railroad so from here trains would go whoop in all these directions so they connected them via this tunnel and the outcome is that you have a bunch of through lines that self-intersect because they go um, so as I said it is kind of awkward but um, it gives you through service, and every train stops at the three central stations, which are called um, Market East um, or Jefferson, I guess, Suburban, uh, and 30th Street. Suburban, because before the tunnel was built, intercity train would go through to do through service in New York to Washington, and then suburban trains would go through to sub to the station. So it only serves the suburbs and suburban station. Um, this is kind of a replacement of Reading Terminal Market East, um, and uh, then a bunch of and, and then trains tend to also serve Temple, and the ones that go over this direction on this direction also go to uh, uh, I think it's called University City, the station. I don't know why it's called. Maybe they've renamed it Penn Medicine, not sure. Um, but anyway, so um, because you have this rapid succession of stops, you want to get trains in and out fast. So this is where it's really important to have a good egress, so Philadelphia should only be running single levels. Philadelphia also only is running single levels. Uh, they've not done bi-levels. The main reason to get bi-levels is if you just need the seating capacity, and Philadelphia has never been in that position. So they're getting single levels for now. Maybe they'll screw up and do by levels. I mean, in New York, they're trying to do that. In Boston, there, they think they need by levels. Um, now, in Boston, they don't have this through service because uh, there's South Station, there's North Station, they do not connect. Plans to connect them in something called the North South Rail Link have been in development now for 30 something years now. And the. Um, 
So uh, before an SRL, you should probably do single levels uh, to get trains in and out of the various stations quickly, but when it's conducted, you absolutely have to run only single levels. Now, switch on again, it's not that use case. Now, they do have, now I'm very clear, they do have these tunnels under Zurich. Zurich has two such tunnels, in fact. Uh, I guess those are still down because it's a four track tunnel, but Zurich is small. And um, and they do uh, buy levels there, but Zurich is, again, it's not a very large city. Um, the way it's designed is the trains do all for a minute at city center. They have, uh, each of the two tunnels has extra tracks, so two approach tracks feeding four station tracks, uh, because essentially that's the only station that's in the tunnel, I believe. Um, so, so you can get away with that. Uh, so again, think what kind of city, what your needs are. The tool, this tool is giving information about single levels because of because the original, like all of these examples are high speed rail. Now, oh, they did rename University City. Okay, yeah, fine. So open rail and up new new the renaming and just not know it. Okay. Um, so if you have questions like single level versus high level. Uh, which again, in Switzerland, they decided to go by level. It was likely the correct decision given Switzerland's needs. So, egress is not that important for the intercity rail network, um, just because of how it's run and so on. Um, and, and and they have the platform mount was important. Now, um, so that's the rolling stock bar. Now, infrastructure is where we get to do exciting things with uh, drawing lines on a map. But wait, we're not just going to draw lines on the map. It's not about high speed rail, uh, or exclusively about high speed rail. We're going to take existing lines and then see what kind of speed we can squeeze on them. And then, if things go well, we rest on our laurels, uh, and uh, that, uh, and uh, then we, we take uh, we write a schedule, and then we rest. We take a nap. We uh, go play video games. We go on uh, Twitter and inform people uh, politely and gently that they uh, should delete their accounts, and um, the and everything is nice. Unfortunately, sometimes things are not very nice, and then uh, you you might get a situation where you're very carefully laying out a timetable on a train that should run every hour. And the one-way trip time is an hour and nine minutes. This is literally what Zurich to Bern was. I believe it was exactly an hour and nine. Now, let's think about it. If the train runs every hour and it takes 53 minutes, like Zurich to Basel, or 56 even, like Zurich to Bern now, it's very easy. Uh, I have two train sets. I mean, more because there are more cities in Switzerland than Zurich and Bern, but let's say it's, these are the only two cities. And it's, okay, 56 minutes, uh, and it's a two-hour cycle time, right? Because 56 minutes, let's say you turn in four, if I'm, fa if I'm very fast, which Switzerland is, because they optimize the infrastructure use out of necessity and lack of money. And so 56 was worth an hour, so my train departs Zurich a little bit after, let's say, the even hour, gets to Zurich, gets to burn a little before the odd hour, departs burn a little after the odd hour, gets back to Zurich a little bit before the even hour, so it's a two-hour cycle now, okay? So an hourly train is two train sets. Now, let's say instead of 56 minutes, it's an hour. Now, you can, you can see why, first of all, we need three train sets. <laughs> Even though the difference between the between an hour and nine and fifty six minutes is not that large, both of them you can mentally round to an hour. Second, the entire Swiss system is based on uh, connections on the hour um, and on the half hour at major stations, so you can't do the a little before and a little after the hour. Things will just not meet. Uh, and then uh, you need to squeeze as much speed as you can out of the line that you have. And what they did in Switzerland this is where you see the one high speed line. So high speed line is red, the one high-speed rail in Switzerland, it's not that fast, it's 200 kilometers an hour. A bunch of tunnels, though, because Swiss terrain is between Olten, this is the uh, point, this is the connection point between trains from Zurich and Basel and uh, Bern. And almost all the way from Olten, almost all the way to Bern, 
they just built a new line. You can see the old line in orange here, but they built a new one just to speed things up so that trains would run as fast as necessary, just less than an hour, and then they would make the connections, and it was nice. Um, and with this kind of uh, thinking, Switzerland has a pretty large margin in Europe's uh, highest rail ridership per capita. Um, well, uh, number two is not even France. Number two is goes Switzerland, then Austria, Netherlands, France, Sweden, Germany. I think that works. Um, so, um, so this is a run trains as fast as necessary slogan. This is what it means. It means you speed things up again based on the timetables you need. Now, again, Switzerland is not a very highly populated country. These are not very large cities, so yeah, they were planning around hourly and then half hourly trains. Now, if what you're planning is trains that run every ten minutes, you don't care, right? You don't care about fitting into an exact hourly thing. I mean, 10 minutes is a level at which people make on time transfers. So um, if you're running that fast, uh, no, sorry, that frequently, yes, you can do time transfers, but you should be opportunistic about this and not waste too much effort. So for example, in Berlin, um, this, I'm pretty sure this will be seen here. So in Berlin, we do have a time transfer, when, uh, a bunch of them when trains run every 10 minutes. So for example, here, um, you see that the S-Bahn goes whoop, and the U-Bahn runs whoop, and it's every 10 minutes each. The U-Bahn runs every 5 minutes closer in, but beyond Vorotal is every 10 minutes. And, the, and you can see that these are kind of parallel here. This is a single station with four tracks. You can see how it's cross-platform here. And the way it works is that uh, the train's in the same direction. So not in opposite direction, but the same direction, so westbound, westbound, or eastbound, eastbound, uh, they're timed. Um, so this is kind of an opportunistic time transfer. It's every 10 minutes, you should absolutely do these things. But again, just maybe same direction, maybe when it's plausible, you're not going to try to set up a timetable so that trains in many directions will, will exchange passengers every 10 minutes the way that they do um, every hour, or sometimes every half hour in Swiss, in Swiss cities, because... Um, uh, because that's a wait of a couple of minutes for the shuffle, and then you're losing so much time if it's a train every 10 minutes. And again, every 10 minutes, people will wait, you know, the eight or nine minutes if it's a bad transfer. I mean, they don't want to, but if, if, especially if it's a long distance train and not something that's this short, yeah, that's fine. Um, especially if it's a, or if it's a subway that's every five minutes, you practically never care. Um, over here at Mellingdom, the uh, Mellingdom is. U7, which is this, U6, which is this, they have a time transfer. Um, but I'm pretty sure the time transfer is only reliable um, in the evening when it's every 10 minutes and not daytime when it's every five, because every five, whatever, people can wait. Um, so, so, again, be sensitive to what kind of timetable you want to run um, when you try to design the infrastructure for this. Uh, this is what I mean by, by this kind of coordination. And when you're crayoning, um, again, th um, so think what your needs are. And uh, so do you need very high performance? If in Europe, generally, they go for performance on the regional trains, not the S-Bahn trains, so uh, short distance ones, the ones that are in green here. But the ones that are in orange, the uh, regional trains, the ones that maybe don't run every 10 minutes, but every hour, every half hour, they run much farther away uh, than just the city and its suburbs. Um, the, uh, so for these trains, they have high-performance trains. That's something we have in Europe. In Japan, they don't really have that. In Japan, essentially, they have these crazy high-performance Shinkansen trains, and they have these very cheap, very reliable 100 kilometers an hour, 120 kilometers an hour, maybe um, urban trains, um, and here we're better than them at the in-between level, so the trains that are, so at both of these levels, Japan is better than us, at the in-between, at the in-between level, so top speed, let's say 160 is where um, our trains shine, and I don't think I have in the in this code the exact data for this, um, so I can just tell you what 
a thing like the floor looks like. This is something where you can get the numbers in. So YouTube will actually have videos. Uh, let me see if I can find the. You, uh, how about I not show you all of them? YouTube flirt acceleration video. Okay, yeah. So these exist. You can look for them. Uh, a bunch of people take photos of this, and you can see how fast these trains accelerate to various speeds, and you can uh, write down times on the video and uh, compare this. And, that, and actually, a lot of uh, the work that went into this was me just sanity checking and seeing what is correct for the flirt um, to have numbers that are at least somewhat in uh, accordance with the video evidence. And uh, and actually, when we wrote these uh, appendices for the regional rail plan, so things like Haverhill or, uh, or Worcester, um, I think we mentioned the flirt at one point as an example, train set, and the... Uh, MBTA people who saw this didn't really get what we were saying and said, well, the flirt is a low floor crane. Yes. Um, and, and, then I, and then we had to explain, yeah, no, we know. The reason we said flirt and not literally every other EMU is just because we literally had uh, exact acceleration data for the flirt from videos rather than everything, rather than using a predicted formula. Um, so, but, but the prediction formula, again, it works. It's essentially the same numbers. So what you want to do um, is uh, if you use this app and uh, this applet, and I have a link to it on my blog. As I said, I'm not a real programmer. This is not a GitHub. Um, the, uh, yeah, I think it's called Train Performance Calculator. And um, what you want to do is, let's say, let's define the... So um, A, B, and C are random numbers that uh, are the track resistance or like air resistance factors. Um, and these are exact numbers for a high speed belting train, but only 200 kilometers an hour, so not that aerodynamic in Sweden. And uh, these numbers change a lot based on the train, but they usually change in opposite directions. If one of them goes up, the other go down. And to be honest, these are not terribly important at the speed we're talking about, up to about 130, 160 kilometers an hour. Um, and if we're doing flirt, then M is going to be, so M flirt, let's call it. I'm going to do something very crazy. I'm going to use a variable with more than one letter, uh, which I normally don't do because I think like MF person, not like a programmer. Um, actual programmers have mocked me for this. So M flirt, this is initial acceleration is going to be at 1.25. K flirt is the power to weight ratio. It is going to be 18. Uh, now there's a, there are weird power to weight ratio issues about uh, uh, maximum versus continuous power at, uh, at wheel. This is maximum, but this is with passenger. It's going to be 18, and it's just the number of ordinates for numerical integration. I said 500, but let's do 2,000 to be more certain. So we're going to do. Uh, so this is so the name of the of the so, so is so the name of the function you want to do is slow pan. Uh, and again, it's written here. This is actually like there's actually a user guide to this. So we want slow pan. And this is, will even tell you what variable to take. So K, but we're doing K flirt. A, B, C, and flirt. X1 and X2 are speed. So let's say from zero to top speed. Um, 160 kilometers an hour, it's 4.44 meters per second. This tells us 47 seconds. So acceleration time. So technically, it means that, uh, let's say, uh, X. Time. It's well, uh, this is how it works. Is sixty four seconds at this? So that's the distance over which uh, the train will travel. Because it's, I mean, you're not literally waiting sixty four seconds, right? Um, Travels 1.8 kilometers. Now, in reality, um, now is a caution. Both of these numbers are level. 
um, the videos will, so the videos have a slowdown in the acceleration right near the top speed, which is clearly not a matter of air resistance. It's just, um, the, they're, um, throttling down the motor. So it, it's not 1.8 kilometers, it's two kilometers and it takes not 64 seconds, but 68 or 69, but it essentially washes out because it doesn't really matter what the acceleration rate is at 155 kilometers an hour up to a top speed of 160, right? Because the difference between 160 and 155 is basically nothing over the distances we're talking about, which are between, usually maybe it's between two regional rail stops, but also if it's an intercity train, I mean, it's gonna be like half a second total. Um, and so um, the, but so slow pan, I mean, so slow pan is ACK pan, so acceleration plus deck pan, which is deceleration. Um, so uh, 1780, let's say 0.69 divided by this. So the point is that the train takes for 64 seconds to travel a distance of it, a top speed would travel in 40. So the di difference between them is 24 seconds. And then similar thing in deceleration, it's a little faster because air resistance is not, it, um, does not slow you down anymore. Does not slow down your deceleration, obviously it speeds it up if anything. So it's, um, uh, so the sum of these is 47 seconds. Um, so this means that if on a line that has no restrictions, it, you can, um, the only thing that will ever slow you down from top speed is uh, stations. Every station adds 47 seconds to your trip time plus dwell time. Remember, this does not include the time that the train uh, that the train doors stay open. And um, this is which is something you should usually set at 30 seconds. Uh, now. It's not something that you set at 30 seconds just because um, you throw darts on, uh, on the board and, uh, and I think if you actually play darts, the numbers only go to 20. Wait, what? There's no game that's called darts. Okay, yeah, that's... Yeah, it only goes up until 20. Yeah, so it's not like I threw a um, two darts and added the numbers and I got 30, right? now. Um, the way it works is that, um, so again, we're talking about total integration. So this is something that we do write in our Boston Regional Rail Um It's something that a lot of places have already done, regrettably not all. Um, I know that I um, have a follower from Philadelphia who wanted to see this, Philadelphia is fully electrified, but is not done, so it's called level boarding. Um, now, level boarding means that I can get on a train from the platform without changing elevation. Now, it's a form of wheelchair accessibility as well, right? Because if I'm in a wheelchair, then I can't navigate very large elevation differences. I need a ramp. And so if there are steps getting on the train, then it is inaccessible to me if I'm in a wheelchair. But this is not the same as wheelchair accessibility. It's one component of several of wheelchair accessibility because you could absolutely have level boarding without wheelchair accessibility. For example, subways practically always have level boarding, but often don't have elevators, um, regrettably, and this means that they're not wheelchair accessible, um, but they still have level boarding. So even for passengers without um, disabilities, this is useful because it means you get on all faster. Um, there is uh, an MBTA study from the 2000s for the Fairmount line, which uh, claimed that they can have the uh, egress time per passenger through level boarding, and they can have it again based on the door placement. So um, the, another thing that matters, and again, it's always something you can ask. So, so level boarding you should always have. There's no excuse not to have it on regional rail ever. Uh, even in Europe, in Europe we have lower we have lower floor standard, lower platform standards, so we have trains with lower floors. Intercity rail here is a little more problematic because we have these low floors, and intercity trains are essentially all high uh, are, are essentially all high floor. Um, but uh, but for regional rail, there's no excuse. Uh, if it's not done, then it's because whoever runs the system hates people in wheelchairs, um, which is regrettably very common. But again, it's not just for wheelchairs. I mean, I mean, so you can do, if you can't do this, you can maybe do something with, it's just one step versus three steps. Um, so in, in the United States, platforms are either high or low. 
So high means actually high. Uh, the standard is four feet. So meter 20 to centimeters. And low means actually low. It's, I think, eight inches or something, so 20 something centimeters. Here we have the intermediate standard, so 55 centimeters and 76 centimeters. And uh, some S bonds are higher, like in Berlin or in Munich. Uh, and, uh, and the train floors are designed to meet these standards. You can have a train with level boarding to 550. You can definitely have one with level boarding to 760. Uh, to below 550, you can't. 550 is kind of the lower limit of what you can do, which is one of the reasons it's a standard. Um, and uh, But again, it's much more common to... So if you're in the United States, don't worry about the European standards of 550 and 760. Britain doesn't worry about them because it has a large installed base of high platforms, whereas here we have large installed bases of 550 and 760. Um, Asia doesn't do 550 and 760. The uh, platforms in China and Japan that are used for high-performance trains on regional trains and also on high-speed trains are um, 1250 millimeters, so a meter 25, so essentially the same as Northeast Corridor. Um, and um, so again, always get level boarding, but um, then ask yourself, uh, beyond the level boarding, what's the door placement you need? Uh, so. In the United States, there are two ways to do door placement. There's actually three ways to do door placement on a train. The first is, the, for example, in, the, in Boston, there are two very narrow doors. They're called single wide in Europe, so about 70 centimeters to maybe a meter. Uh, and it, they're at the very edges of the car. And the reason is that if you need uh, to board to low platforms, then you're going to have steps. Um, now, you absolutely can have steps in the middle of the train, but the way they like doing it in America is that the uh, entire train floor is high, and then there are trap doors that can be opened um, for low platform stations, because some stations have low platforms and some have high platforms. Um, so, uh, so they have to be at the edges of the car. So passengers get on through a narrow door, they climb steps, and they only have one direction to go into because into the car, um, because the moving between cars is very obstructed as well. Now, um, you can, so you can do level boarding. Um, some of the lines in Boston have level boarding at every station, uh, at every station like the old calling lines. Some don't, but some stations will have level boarding. Um, so again, level boarding will roughly have your uh, uh, egress line per passenger. Um, and this is independent of single versus bi level questions. The other question is then where the doors are. Um, so the example, so, so I gave you an example. Oh, yeah, thanks, Ethan. So I gave you an example of a uh, very obstructed door placement, and then there are two that are less obstructed. The, let's call it the good one and the bad one. The bad one is the door is three doors. Per, like, I mean, three doors per side, two that are, as I said, and then one in the middle that only interfaces high platforms. They have this um, on some lines in New York. Very few. It's, it's very uncommon, and it is rather shit. Um, and the good one is something that only works if all the uh, platforms are high level. Very common in New York on the LIRR and uh, Metro North. Uh, not just in New York, it's, uh, I think London's commuter trains tend to do that. Um, quite a lot of regional trains here have that, which is that um, you have two doors per side of a car, and they're at the quarter points, and they're double wide. Double wide means about a meter point four, a meter point five in width. And then passengers can enter two at a time or exit two at a time. And they have two directions to go in, right? Because the quarter point, um, I'm indifferent to going left or right, right? Because I mean, I mean, if I, I'm going to get the door, if I'm like one half of the train, so it's in the middle of the half of the train, hence the quarter points. Uh, this turns out to be twice as fast as uh, the two uh, ed, uh, car and single wide. Um, now there, are, so essentially, you should start from two double wides. At the quarter points and go on from there. So, for example, uh, if it's a very busy urban line like the RERB, they don't have two 
of these are four. So they're not quite right. They're four evenly spaced double wide doors per side of every car. Um, the subways do the same thing. Um, the Berlin S-Bahn does this. The Munich S-Bahn uh, takes these. Uh, the, the, I believe the Munich S-Bahn is something that's very similar to these uh, two quarter point doors um, on these high performance trains, but instead of two doors per side of a car, it's three. Uh, and again, this is only if you're doing something very busy in a very large city. Munich is not a very large city, but Munich is a city that needs two or three S-Bahn tunnels. It only has one. The one S1 tunnel it has is critically crowded. It is considerably more crowded than each of the three lines of Berlin. Um, we are a much larger city than Munich, but not by a factor of three. Um, or by a factor of, I don't know, less than two. I think we're five million in Munich. So, uh, so they need a lot of, uh, um, so, so they need a lot of, uh, capacity on the train, they have very long trains, but also a lot of egress capacity, so a lot, so, so I believe they use more doors as a result. And uh, so again, think about what kind of trains you need, and this by the way not going to influence the timetable because it's just it's going to scale with, the, with your dwell times, more doors are not going to change the train performance that's modular. Uh, in, in, in Tokyo, by the way, in Tokyo it's four as well, uh, four pairs of doors per car. Uh, and the cars are 20 meters long. They're on. I mean, in Paris, I guess it's 25, I think. Um, so, so again, lots of doors just so people can get in and out very fast because it's Tokyo. Um, uh, yeah, so the main cost of doors is that you don't have seating facing the doors. This is why you don't have a train that's entirely door. Uh, so that's the main... Uh, so, but again, it's something that's going to be less relevant to the schedule. So when you're writing this, so because all of these things are interconnected, you need to think about them. It's useful to know that there are certain decisions that are not going to matter for certain things. So for timetabling purposes, we don't care how many doors we have. We just need to make sure we have enough so that the dwell times can be kept to 30 seconds. If we want to be very aggressive, even 20 seconds at the outlying stations. Uh, city center stations, probably one a minute. Um, and when I say city center for Bostonians, I do not mean Back Bay. I mean South Station with North South Rail. Um, back Bay, get people in and out in 30 seconds, please. Um, I mean, yes, I get that it's a business district, but we have business districts here, and this is not the primary one. I'm sorry. Um, and so the uh, so so all of these are the kind of preliminaries of how you're going to do this kind of timetable. And again, everything has to be integrated. And again, it's actually, so, integra so integration actually works with the crayon really well, which is how those of us who began our careers in real advocacy is just drawing crayon of where, of what extensions to existing subway systems we want. Why it's so natural for us to transition to this kind of planning, because when you have this kind of high-level thinking, yeah, you can say, oh, right, we need to do this tweak in order to make this timetable. We need to do this tweak. Um, just to make everything work together. And if you're instead thinking about this in very experiential things of, oh, I've worked in this industry 25 years and I do not know that Berlin has trains because I only go to Europe on vacation uh, and, I, uh, and I look down on people who think too much about Europe because I'm a real New Yorker um, and, uh, and we don't have, uh, and we have a funding crunch because our Pfizer capital plan is only getting $50 billion. And so let's, uh, think about, uh, like little, uh, about little, uh, tweaks within the same paradigm, the same train sets. Um, that is something that does not work with us very well, um, with, with this kind of scheduling and you see the results. So, uh, so the point is that we have this kind of system of total integration and say we, not we transit my route, but also we transit my route, but we Northern Europe. Um, and slowly it's making its way down to the rest of Europe through people wanting to be like Germany, to be honest. A lot of it is just self power, uh, which is why Italy is doing it better than France, because France is too proud. So France has a lot of good timetabling practices, but the kind of magic triangle thing that I was talking about, they just don't do that. And Italy is actually doing better timetabling on the regional lines uh, as of lately, because Italy uh, is uh, in full panic mode over its relative poverty. 
um, in Sectation, and Spain is the same thing, and France is not very good at that yet. They eventually will, don't worry. Um, just take them time. Just as it took us time to learn from France and do vaccine passes. Uh, no biggie, only a couple hundred people are dying of corona every day. Um, so the so, so that's kind of the high level coverage of what you're going to do. And when you do that, the way we're doing this is, um, is we have this kind of speed zone assessment. And um, so again, there's a professional way of doing it. And as I warned you at the beginning of this video, it's going to be jank. And the reason it's jank is that, um, as I mentioned, my coding skills don't think I'm going to be hired as a uh, head uh, uh, as like a head of anything working like it not had at uh, Google ever. So um, the way this called is called string diagram, and this is a good rail practice and also an American rail practice. Um, so what you do is you draw the line. I'm actually check if you can see the. Okay, so great. So this is going to be cut off. I'm sorry, but you don't need to. But far right is not that important. And so the so the way that this works is you draw up vertically the line with its various important points, which can be so th this might be uh, um, so this includes the main stations, but also important junctions, uh, and then uh, you know the speed. So this is how it's going to uh, so that is the slope, uh, and the timetable moves to the right. So uh, if the lines move uh, are steeper, then it means the train is faster because it means less time. Because this is dist because y is distance, x is time, so y over x is speed. Um, and you can see, for example, uh, where the meets are. So this is this might be on a single track line. So when you have trains going in different uh, directions of meet, so in this case it's at Klotz then uh, you're going to need to make sure you have double track so that the trains can meet. Um, and if you have slow and fast trains uh, on, the, on the same line, I guess on this example they don't, but on others they might. For example, our Worcester line uh, timetable. Then uh, it will be seen as, uh, a, as two lines in the same direction, but one with a steeper slope than the other. Uh, and then you need to make sure you have a uh, quadruple track uh, passing sideway. And work at the very least triple track, but ideally quadruple. So, um, the, so again, this is how professionals do this. Um, the, at, uh, so at Volpa, they're even talking about uh, uh, tools for this. And I guess in this example, uh, the meets, do they have over text? No, yeah, this is, I think, on the... Wait, this is actually the Worcester line. It's actually the Worcester. This is actually a Boston thing. So there are actually, so this is, I guess, the current ops on the Worcester line. Um, and... Uh, uh, okay, maybe I should not have app data of this. Uh, so if you want to read this, I guess I need to do dot. 950 Volberg string line. Yeah. yeah, this. Yes, there are great. This is exactly what I'm looking for. So, this is the link. It's called the String Line Interface Railroad Scheduling Tool. Uh, and this is just download. Um, and, uh, yeah, so for example, the strings, so okay, so the strings visualize where the meets are. Um, now, uh, Swiss people are very lazy. Um, and I don't mean lazy in the sense that they all like to sit around at home and uh, sleep. They don't do that, and judging by their corona rates, not even when they should be staying at home. No, what I mean is they don't really like repetitive work over on uh, so what do they do they try to minimize that so this is where the importance of a clock face timetable or in German takt 
in French it's called or, or in French, or I can't always say it, but it's a German invention, it's talked. Uh, comes into this. Timetables need to repeat. Why do they need to repeat? They should be repeating every fixed interval. The interval can be whatever you want. If you uh, hate your passengers, you can absolutely have a repetition every 68 minutes. Uh, you'll be surprised at how many bus networks in the United States have these things where the timetable is every 65 minutes or every 70 minutes on a, on a lot of different routes. Uh, and passengers are expected to take that. And these bus systems magically uh, have approximately zero riders who earn more than uh, the poverty line. And so the situation is that if you don't need your passengers, it should be a, uh, a divisor for the hour so that I do not need to do complicated math in my head. I don't like doing math. Um, I try to minimize the amount of math that I do. This has always been the case, okay? So let's say that I'm trying to uh, uh, prove some results about p-adic uh, analysis in several variables. Uh, I do not want to have to compute things in several variables. But, uh, and by the way, uh, everything involving several variables, nobody will ever write down the equations because nobody wants to sit down and write horrendously complicated equations for, I don't know, an abelian surface or, or something. Um, uh, so what do we do? We try to do as little work as possible. Um, when it, if, so if I'm the writer, I do not want to have to compute this in my head. I just make it an hour or half an hour, whatever, okay, so that I can know. Let's say that um, I need to do math, you know, for, for, for a living, um, in between teaching uh, 100 students at UBC um, calculus, and uh, I need to get to work, uh, and my bus stop, which was, for the record, uh, this is something, and what I'm describing is something that was uh, 2013 to 2014, so eight years ago. Um, Let's say I need to get to campus. Now, over my dead body, am I going to wake up in the morning for this? Because my class is in the afternoon. It is 2 in the afternoon. And uh, my office is uh, about the... And, and my office looks like... You know the scene in office space where there's this guy who uh, um, the boss hates and turns out that he was fired and was laid off anyway, so they're trying to get rid of him secretly, so they put him in this kind of basement office. This is essentially what the postdoc offices at UBC look like. Point being, I do not go there unless I have a reason to be there to teach. So I'm going to get to a class that I'm teaching at two in the afternoon. Uh, my bus stop is uh, thankfully a rapid bus. It's called Vine and Forth. Uh, and there's a bus on a 12-minute takt, one minute after the hour. In English, 1, 13, 25, 37, 49 minutes after the hour, all day during the off-peak uh, period, there's a bus going from my home to campus. Uh, I know how long it takes because it's my regular commute. Uh, 49 bus makes me... Uh, so one, the 149 is making me late to my own class. 137 is the last they can take. I try to make it to the 113, or if I'm running, or if I'm for some reason uh, running late because whatever, 125. I can tell I can tell you what the timetable was uh, for a regular commute that I did for about a year, like an academic year, eight years ago, because this is how good talks are for memorization. So the talks is really two tools. The first is the memorization tool, so you want things to be divisors of the hour. The second is the planning tool to coordinate various lines. Remember, we're doing coordinated planning. Coordination means you coordinate on the same line, uh, the timetable, the infrastructure, and the rolling stock, but also you coordinate different lines. We talked before about the issue of time transfers, um, but it's not just time to coordinate connections, other things. And so you want to have the same interval for everything. So uh, this is where you're doing things in terms of the hour, maybe. You can, uh, 
look at our ones and if the passengers can do infinite math in their head and it's better to do talk to every 67 minutes or every 52 minutes or whatever but again even though we could do that we don't do that because we don't hate the passengers um but we uh, but we but we do repeat things so the um, timetable is going to look periodic this does not look periodic because it is planned by americans uh what should be is see the hour the uh, this should be periodic every hour. Maybe if it's long distance, every two hours. Uh, maybe less than, maybe every fraction of an hour. Thirty minutes, twenty, fifteen, whatever. This is of crucial importance. And now this really simplifies our work. Why? Um, because we have something called a symmetry axis. So in addition to having a tact, which again this does not because it's America, and there's something called a symmetry, which this also doesn't have because it's America. Um, symmetry means you pick a symmetry time. Let's say zero zero. Um, I think zero zero is what they do in Switzerland. I think in the Netherlands it's fifty eight. I forgot what they do in Austria. The Deutschland talk is going to be zero zero. What zero zero means is that if my train um, from uh, so so if uh, my train from I don't know Berlin to Munich or, or whatever passes uh, through airport on the hour, every half hour, which is what is planned for the direct contact, southbound, then symmetrically, it should also do so northbound. The symmetry is always around zero in this case. Um, so if you're southbound uh, two minutes after the hour, every hour, then northbound, you should be two minutes before the hour, or in English, 58 minutes after the hour, every hour. Um, this is how things should work. It's symmetric schedules. This means that the overtakes um, are also are always going to be in the same location uh, in both directions. Now, this is slightly perilous. Why? Because if my overtake is in the same location, I need to make sure that I have four tracks. And if I only have three, that's possible. But I need to make sure the overtake is not simultaneous. So it's not four trains passing. It, need, it needs to be two and then some other time based on the center axis is going to be two uh, in the opposite direction. Um, this is what we're doing with the Worcester line, by the way, because in the, with the Worcester line, there's already a triple track plan. Not the Worcester line, this is the Worcester line. Um, there's a triple track, and, I, and this is so, um, forgive me, this is so here we have a lot of uh, graphics because we start, because our graphics got better over time. Um, so you can see things like the planned line speed. You can see things like the planned line speed. Um, we did not do that for Worcester, and uh, nor and in Worcester we also didn't depict the triple track segment. So let me find it on. Uh, so so all of these graphics are things that we only started doing after Worcester. Ooh, nice. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, because it, for Worcester a lot of this is really important technically. Um, just to explain how on what I think is a shoestring budget, uh, you can make magic happen just by doing things like timetable, the trains do not uh, conflict. So the issue is that over here in Newton, there, there are missing stations here. There's Newtonville, here there's Oberdale. Um, here there's a station that used to exist, which was actually the central Newton station. It no longer exists. We proposed a reference called Newton Corner. Um, this is a this is a two-track segment and will never be anything better unless you have a tunnel because uh, they used to have four tracks here and then they built the turnpike. Um, and now this is a very narrow two-track corridor where the there's only, the platforms are only on one track. So the... Okay, now they do show Newtonville and Obernail. So uh, I'm forgetting which of the two tracks it is. But the point is that the trains don't even serve these stations of uh, reverse peak because the way it works is that the peak direction stops at these stations and the uh, reverse peak direction doesn't. And then they cross, and, and if it's the wrong way, because again, I don't remember which is the right way, uh, then they cross uh, over each other somewhere here, I think. Wellesley, you can have whatever you want, but they I think keep to that. Um, but um, so this is very steep and they're finally rebuilding the platforms and we're gonna do two platforms at very high cost. Should be, Normally, I don't know, 
10, 15 million per station. Boston does it for 20 to 25, and this is going to be about 40 each, just because it's very terrible lo location with lots of constraints and lots of inaccessible sidewalks for elevators that ideally you would not need. Um, so the um, um, and even then, you're not going to widen this. Again, if there's high-speed rail, yes, it's going to be a tunnel here. Sorry. Um, so there, but there is a triple track. So you can't have local and express trains uh, overtake here. We can't. I mean, the trains are going to run into each other. It's two tracks. And you might ask, but wait, along two tracks, one local, one express. The trains can, uh, if I'm driving, right? If, I, if I'm driving on a two-laner and I'm trying to... Uh, overtake the car ahead of me, I just swerve in the wrong direction and do this, right? On a road, you can do that, not on a railway. The hit you take into capacity is insane. Just as on a road, you would do it on a two-laner. Which roads get two lanes? Not very high traffic roads, right? I mean, if it's a high traffic road, then it's going to be a divided highway. I guess in... Yeah, if I, yeah. Divided highway, sorry, dual carriageway is the British term. You're going to have a divided highway. Uh, you're going to have two, three lanes in each direction. Then you can do, uh, and, and they specifically will uh, will upgrade the uh, uh, highway. They will widen it with a median and so on. So you will not need to do this because it, because this murders your capacity. And if you and because drivers are always going to try to do that anyway, it's just going to lead to crashes um, on a train. You're just murdering your capacity, so you don't do that. You only do same direction overtakes, which means you need more than two tracks. That does not exist on this line. Now, there have been plans. Now, if you were to ask me, I would say, okay, this section should be four track. Now, they have plans for very long triple track because the plans were written by people who did not think very well about integration, but thankfully, it's not that terrible. So the triple track right now is through Wellesley. Uh, I think they're supposed to also extend it here, but this is completely unnecessary. This is the important part. And then, um, remember, we're doing a symmetric schedule. So overtakes in two directions will always occur at the same spot, but not necessarily at the same time. What is at the same time? Remember, we have a symmetry schedule around 0, 0. So wherever the train, whichever place the train serves at 0, 0, necessarily is a meet because the train's in opposite directions, uh, because, uh, because because there's an underground zero, but also the antipode of zero, so 30. Now, if it's every 30 minutes, it's the same thing, zero and 30, but also the, antip also the antipode, which is 15 and 45. Um, and if you remember this, then on a single line, you don't need a string diagram, you just need to know what, uh, what to do and what the offsets should be. Um, and so in, uh, I should not be showing you Hazel. Um, and so the, or, or this work, should be showing, open rail map. Uh, and where is our timetable? Yeah, this is the timetable. Up uh, here. So um, if you look at this, now we don't say what the offsets are. Now the offsets should be um, local leaving, I believe, four minutes. <laughs> after the hour and express 11 um, and then 4 plus this is 26 11 plus this is 25 so um, the overtake is going to be around Wellesley Farm um, uh, Borners will get you in a sec so the um, so the overtake is going to be here, and where's the overtake? We said about 26 minutes, ish, 25 to 26 after the hour, which is amazing. Remember, uh, meets are at half the interval. The interval is 30 minutes, maybe 15. Um, so if the interval is 30 minutes, when do we uh, meet? The answer is uh, 0, 15, 30, 45. Remember, we always meet. At the when when the symmetry schedule when the symmetry point is zero zero, which is the way you should do this because um, it should reduce mental tax on passengers. The meet points are always the uh, interval and the antipode, like the half the interval. Um, and if it's fifteen minutes and it's every seven point five minutes, and we said remember twenty five twenty six minutes, that does not touch 
even 22.5 um, after the hour level on 30. So great. Uh, we're not going to have conflicts. Triple track is fine. Uh, and so, um, so again, you always want to think about this. You always want to think about building the least amount of infrastructure possible because money, uh, the origin of money is non-arboreal. I'm sorry, Stephanie Felton. No, I'm not sorry. You're a fucking hack. But, um, the, uh, and this means that the, uh, and this means that you should always start to build the least infrastructure possible. If you look in both Japan and Switzerland in different ways, they have, they, they have insanely underbuilt systems. They have, I think within the city limits of Zurich, there's a small section that somehow stays single track. If it's not in the single city limits of Zurich, then it's the inner suburbs. It's a, it's the, it's one of the trunk lines. I believe it's the right bank of Lake Zurich. So, so Lake Zurich is part of a river system. So they think in terms of a left bank and a right bank. And this is not Zurich, this is a city with better food than Zurich. Um, I want to say better food and worse politics, but actually no, Zurich. Uh, the suburbs of Zurich are where uh, the Swiss People's Party is uh, based, especially they're like more radical person, Blocher. Uh, whereas the, um, whereas I guess in uh, northern Italy, they have Lega, but I think Milano, Milano, Milano itself is a good one. So I'm forgetting which point of this, but so this specific line, this is the right bank of Lake Zurich, um, because the river goes that way. Um, so that line is, um, is not fully double track. I'm forgetting where the single track point is, but somehow they manage to run trains every 15 minutes almost. Um, and they just schedule them to not conflict. You shouldn't do this on the, I mean, you don't want a long single track line every 15 minutes ever, but you can do it if there's a short segment. And uh, this is also true in Tokyo, the Yokosuka line. Uh, the outer segment of it has a single track portion with a passing segment every 15 minutes. Time meets. Um, again, you don't want to double track. You want, I mean, if you have money, then spend the money on important things like more lines or more service. Um, yeah, yeah. So the um, triple track. So, so okay. Question about the balance between triple track express versus passing. Okay, basically, you should never do the triple track express. Like it's a. So, so I keep talking about um, the different ways different countries build things. Triple track express, as far as I can tell, is a New York subway in Uh So a lot of the New York L's from the early 20th century were rebuilt as triple track. Uh, the idea is that you'd have two directions in the peak direction. Two tracks, peak direction, one track, reverse peak. Now, New York does not have giant rail yards in city center, not on the subway. So this means that you're going to have better frequency reverse peak than peak. And this is something that has been, I don't know whether it was noted in real time in the 1910s and 20s, but I saw this in the wild way before anyone said the word expression, frequency is freedom, um, just in New York rail science circles, and people would say, oh yeah, in the Bronx, you get better reverse peak than peak service on the 6, um, on the 6 train, uh, which is one of these three, uh, which one of these uh, 1910s, 20s, triple track, uh, triple track L's. Um, and, and a bunch of these just decided not to do express service anymore, like the four train or the N and W trains in, in Queens, that storyline. Um, and so it's just a bad practice if you're not doing it. Now, what you should be doing is uh, building passing loops where you need. So if you have a triple track strategy, that's fine. Ideally, you should have quad track to not have the not to have the meat constraint. So meet in, so by the way, meet means um, opposite directions. Pass means slow and fast on the same direction. So you don't want the meets and the passes to be uh, to, to to be conflicting with each other. Um, one of the reasons is that you might want to do them at the same state at, at a major station. So actually, I know a bunch of people at WPI who are planning a way to who are thinking of a way to uh, not even have the overtake. Um, in Wellesley, but instead do it in Framingham so that trains would interchange in Framingham and there would be better time connections there. Um, now, I've talked to them about this. What This is technically possible, but has certain other costs. Um, so, I mean, if Massachusetts ever wanted me to actually write their timetables rather than 
writing there for PM, I would tell them, okay, this is this option, this, is this option. These are the trade-offs. I mean, it's it's some lo- I mean, at some level, especially when the costs are very different, it's not my decision. Um, and uh, I want to say just the facts, ma'am. Uh, but literally, the likely next governor of Massachusetts is the one, right? It's Maura Healy, I believe. But anyway, so the um, so about lots of stations with passing loops. The question is always, what kind of service are you trying to run? Now, if you're um, now if, if you're Tama, then uh, you are spamming as much frequency as you humanly can to get um, human to, to get like biome to, to get human mass uh, on a train to Shinjuku and Tokyo. Um, and then the answer to what frequency you want is lots. Um, and then you're doing things like having passing loops at every station, and so that the trains can do um, so, so overtakes. And, so something part about overtakes. You can do two kinds of overtakes: um, exchange overtakes or, or transfer overtakes, or, or on the fly. Um, the wealthy thing that is being planned is on the fly. The framing home alternative would be not on the fly. Would be um, with the connection. Caltrain, um, I believe, on the flies, but um, the timetables that have been promulgated for at least 20 years at this point by Richard Linnick and Clem Tillia, uh, um try to do an exchange at uh, Helldale. So they do have an exchange, so you'd need to do probably four tracks, not three, is that um, at one main state, it, it's going to be probably an important station, let's say an express station, where the where the sequence is this local train comes in, express train comes in, passengers can change, express train leaves, local train leaves. The uh, so this is really good for network connectivity. The drawback is that it delays the local train because the local train needs to stay needs to sit still while it's being overtaken. Um, and this can be quite a long while if it's just at the station. Ideally, you want the quad track segment to extend to, to extend at least one station uh, in each direction. Uh, ideally, even two if you want to have no delay at all. Um, and then there's on the fly where the express train passes without stopping. This is usually faster. Like on the the chore line, it's mostly on the chore line. I think uses both, so Tachikawa and Kokobenji. Um, so let's see if the if the station names are going to be in English on Open Railway Map. Uh, if not, I can point out to you what they are. Nope, they're not in English. So this place is called Tachikawa. This is one of the most important suburban stations in Tokyo. It's quite far from the city. Like so, so the city. I mean, technically, it's in Tokyo Prefecture, but the city is not. I mean, people talk about Tokyo City. They're talking roughly about this area, not the place that's this far. Um, so this is Tachikawa. This is a secondary center. You can kind of see that there's a very dense street network here. This is a dense suburb. Uh, and it's also a branch point. This is the main shore line. It's called the Ome line. Uh, Again, one of the busiest, I, might, I think it might be like the number 15 or 16 busiest JR East station. Um, and then you have another such station. These are the two main suburban stations within um, Tokyo, the prefecture. It's called Kakabenji. Um, so the way this works is that you have a bunch of trains that go, and then the local trains going, the, by the way, the local trains are called rapids because they don't make every stop. But here they make every stop, then they start expressing um, here. But um, so here they make every stop. And there are the special rapids. So these are the express trains. And these are, again, this is all on a, on a double track line. Um, so they go Tachikawa, skip, skip, Kokobenji, skip, skip, skip. You, some of them also hit Mitaka, some of them don't. This is the place where the uh, so at, for Mitaka East, it's a four-track line. So uh, we're talking just about so we're talking about overtakes on a two-track line that stays two-track here and is just the express track and only does Mitaka and then um, 
I don't remember what this. I don't remember the station. It's the hit. It's where where you hit the um the subway, the um Renouchi line, um and then Shinjuku. Uh no, or, or Nakano here also when you hit the Toza line and then Shinjuku. Uh, and uh then again the, the locals just have their own set of tracks. They go right, 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 no, no, right. Like this, and then they don't even go to Tokyo Station. They go there, uh, they cross at Akiba, and uh, they cross at Akiba, and then go like um, through service. Um, the rapids don't run through. They go Tokyo, Frank, Frank, yeah. Uh, and so at every local station here on the two track line. So let's say here Nishikoku Benji. By the way, even though it's a junction station, clearly it is not. An express station. The reason is that the junction it's with a line that used to be a freight bypass um, and was only repurposed for passenger service relatively recently. Um, whereas this used to be a junction with a private railway that actually had done passenger service a while back. Um, so um, the so these are on the fly overtakes. Uh, you get something like four minute delay when a train is being overtaken. These are not on the fly overtakes, these are passing overtakes. Um, and the important thing is, even these are somewhat of a delay. Um, because at the end of the day, you're going from being, uh, usually trains need to be separated by about two minutes, so you're going from being two minutes uh, ahead of an express to two minutes behind an express. Um, and yeah, you can, uh, and yeah, maybe 30 seconds of the four minutes can be the normal station dwell, but that's still 30 seconds. It's actually a big thing on the Shinkansen, because on the Shinkansen, um, it's the uh, minimum separation is much more than two minutes because trains are faster, so it's maybe three, three point something minutes. And so the uh, and so the outcome is that the uh, is that when a local train is being overtaken, even on the fly, it's something like seven minute well because it's that long to ensure safe uh, uh, stopping distances at constant speed. So. Um, so, so, this, so there is a drawback to doing these crazy overtakes, which is you are slowing down the local trains even further. You can do it maybe once, so, so you can do it maybe once or twice on a train journey, but if it happens too much, and that's kind of a chore. And honestly, if, it, if the line is that frequent, just four-track the entire thing, you're going to get more ridership that way. Um, so, um, so, so that's the, the main drawback when you're creating these kinds of timetables. And again, this is when you're doing, and again, this is something you probably do want to do with a string timetable. Um, the only reason, as I said, it's because I suck at coding, but there's, a, but I specifically did not learn how to code this because it's the only place in the entire thing where we're doing local express. Um, there are no other places in Boston where it's appropriate because the Providence line, for example, um, is about as long. So this is one, two, three. 6, 10, 14, 17, 19 stops. The Providence line is about this length, and I think maybe 11 stops or, or, or 10 stops. Where it goes, it's back bay. So, so it goes back bay, um, far still, which is not a current station, something we're proposing. Hyde Park, Reedville, which is also not a current station for the Providence line. Uh, Route 128. Canton Junction, Sharon, Mansfield, Attleboro, South Attleboro. Uh, then there's a station that's about to be built at very high cost because I'm track Pawtucket, and then Providence. Yeah, 12 stations. This is 19, same one. So, um, yeah, plus issues like um, well, like the exact distribution of these stations, Providence line does not need express trains. Um, so you do need to worry about overtakes with Amtrak, but um, I don't work for Amtrak. I mean, I will try to do string diagrams for the high speed rail uh, project that we're going to start very soon this year, or er, very early this year. Uh, just not yet because I'm still putting up the Swedish report for the for, for the construction costs. Um, the the reports are uh, not mostly me writing, thankfully. Um. But the um, but the outcome is that but, but, but the upshot is that um, for just this system, if it's just one line, you can do it by hand. If it's too many lines, you don't want to do it by hand. But 
remember, we have meat. I mean, we, we didn't do offsets here, so we just start from zero. We don't start the local from four minutes with the express from 11 uh, minutes as a, for illustration. And um, the and, and so we didn't uh, so so we didn't go into a lot of detail about how this is um, working, but the um, but the meets again you can just read off of a timetable because you know what time they are. Uh, this is actually really useful when you have single track length. Now this is entirely double track line. Um, there are other lines in the system that aren't like um, so Haverhill has some short single track segments, some of which need to be doubled and down. Um, the Eastern line, so it's called the uh, Newburyport Rockport. Um, we have a, we, ha we have an appendix of that. You don't need to do that. Um, there's actually a single track tunnel on that. So let's zoom from a place that, despite doing everything wrong, doesn't have that much corona to a place that, because it did everything wrong, has a lot of corona. Um, this line is almost entirely double, but the specific bit, the tunnel in Salem, so the hardest part to double is single track. Um, there is a project being proposed to double track it for, I think, $200 million, but because Stephanie Kelton is a hack um, and a, uh, and a, I'm not sure if she's a fraud, I think she believes what she said, because she's a hack, money is non arboreal you don't have 200 million for this 200 million. I mean, if you have 200 million for the line, I mean, there are way better places to spot it. Um, keep a single track. Just make sure to timetable around it so that, remember, we know where the meets are. Um, headway divided by two, right? Make sure that that's not in the tunnel. If it's a short enough single track, remember, they do it in Tokyo, they do it in Zurich. On much more complex systems, this is just one line back and forth. Um, now, the line does split into uh, branches, and these branches are full of single track. Some of them need to be... Oh, it's not being actively planned, because what I heard is that they were... Um, because what I heard is that the, um, it was being proposed somewhere, but if it's not being actively planned, it's excellent. I mean, it's one of these things that probably opens contemporarily with, contemporaneously with NSRL, before NSRL, don't even think about it. Honestly, even post NSRL, you can try to save them. You can see if you can save the money, but honestly, 200 mil on NSRL is something that you can swallow if not having it is too much of a pain. Whereas, yeah, yeah, I mean, you do need more frequency, but I mean, remember, you can do a train every 15 minutes through that tunnel. Now, if you get now, if you want to do a, a real hack, you can even try to put a, a train every seven and a half minutes in each direction through the tunnel, just because the station. This is, this is a very weird thing. So, if you're trying to build... So, the only reason to ever run every more than every 15 minutes through here is not for service to sailing, but for service to Peabody. And the, and the thing is, this is a real... I don't think it's being shown, but there's an actual curve that is might, might be shown as disused, but... The, but either the tracks already uh, or still exist, or, the, or if they don't, the road bike doesn't just put down the tracks on the big deal. And the thing is, the platform is here. And if you do this curve, you're going to have a platform here. So this is so you can even run every seven and a half minutes in each direction through a single track tunnel, but it's a very short tunnel without stations because the station is just outside. This is the best place to put a single track if you have stations on both sides of it. And the reason is that if you're holding a train because of slot issues, you want it to hold at a station. Um, stations are where you have the most leeway because you can tell the driver you only have 25 seconds of a dwell at the station. There's a train that needs to get ahead. Um, and you, so you can do these kind of shaves at a station, but not between stations. So this is actually... A really weird spot we can do very busy single track just because of this location, but that it means you can you need to write the entire schedule around this constraint, uh, which is fine if it's all on the surface. And yeah, I mean yeah, you're spending money on rehabilitating this, but you'll be surprised how cheap rehabilitation can be. Um, and um, so so everything so sometimes everything is about a specific time to transfer. It was about a specific overtake. So this is kind of like where it went in. And I keep talking about this 
terrible code that I wrote. And the reason I talk about this is this way. Uh, so we talk about speed downs. So this code will essentially let you compute the time penalty of moving between speed zones. So the x1, x2 thing, reverse low pun. Uh, so slow pen takes as argument k, which is power to weight, the track resistance factors, m, which is uh, initial acceleration, and then speed zone. So lower speed, higher speed. And again, n is just a uh, ordinate thing. I mean, if I felt like it, I could just set it permanently to 1,000 and not ever remember and not ever deal with it again. But, um, but so the point is that um, you can do this not just from zero to top speed, but also between two intermediate speeds. So, K flirt. A, B, C, M flirt. Let's not say zero. Let's say we have a slow zone of 120 kilometers an hour. So, I don't want to compute it on a fly, and the general speed is 140. Um, and I believe that I don't need to put, actually, let me check something. Okay, yeah, um, I think in Python 2, if you, right, right, because it's 3.6, in, let me see if this, yeah, so in Python 2, when you um, do a integer over integer, it decides that it wants the answer to be an integer and will round. Um, Python 3 is smarter, but it doesn't matter because the 0.6 will uh, tell it this is floating point. Um, the entirety of floating point uh, computation uh, I want to say it makes me want to throw things, but uh, it makes every programmer want to throw things. It's that in uh, time zones. Somehow, time zones have so many exceptions that uh, basically the, uh, all programmers in the world would want um, everyone globally to keep the exact same schedule. So if you're antipodal to wherever is decided as the prime meridian, then you will permanently be nocturnal or something. Um, just because it's that terrible for them to timetable things. Um, so anyway, um, it's, so this is the cost of a 120 slow zones, of a 120 slow zone and a 140 zone. No, it's not quite, because let's say it's a one kilometer zone, then if it's a one kilometer zone, then I need to do this, right? Uh... Because it's a one kilometer that you should be doing at 140, minutes, 120. Um, now this is in hours, so uh, maybe we want it in seconds. And this is four point this. So add these two numbers. If it's a one kilometer slow zone, um, or probably you're going to do instead of slow pan, you could do slow pan over two. So if it's the transition between two zones, because slow pan is bidirectional, right? Acceleration plus deceleration. If it is a transition between two zones, you're only doing one of them at a time, so it's that over two. If you want to be conscientious, use the higher one, which is ACPEN, but the differences will always be rounding errors. Um, so just divided by two. Uh, so this is how, so, so when you have slow zones, so when you have speed zones, um, there's something called speed zone. So, um, Speed zone need to be uh, so the way that this works is that uh, speed zone or, um, and speed zone k is the same except in kilometers an hour not meters per second um, is you need to specify train calculation and then to arrays u and v which give uh, u is the kilometer points v um, is the uh, speeds. Uh, and V has to be length one less than U, and if U and V don't have that length difference, then it will return an error, because uh, the point is that there's a, and the reason it's one less is that uh, the final kilometer point is the end of the line. Uh, this cannot do station, so nowhere in V can you have, nowhere in the array V, because the array U is, uh, uh, the array U is just kilometer points. The array, the array V is the 
speed zones, you cannot ever have zeros. The, the, it, will give, it will give you errors. The program is not smart enough to uh, encode stations in the dwells. Um, it's just this is, uh, difference between speed zones, but I mean, it's fine. I mean, you just do... Uh, I mean, so if the stations are within full speed, you can just do slow pen on them. Um, it's very much uh, like uh, the speed zones are very much something that I wrote for intercity calculations because regional trains work completely differently in the sense that you're just going to have many stations in the same speed zone. Um, and so, um, again, as, as I said at the beginning, it's a, it's a jank code. It's not, I mean, it's you, you can do much better. I mean, you can feed this into like an actual UI that is usable by a human. This is something that I just used to generate um, to generate these time tables. Um, and uh, the so, so this is how you're going to cram time tables. The um, you need to figure out what train you're doing. And again, remember, there's reasons I spent most of this video talking about con about concepts and all about the code. Um, it's all because the concepts are nice and the code is, you know, Thanglium, Glunas, Cthulhu, Relia, Ukanagal, Fatagan. But no, it's because the um, it's because it's really a matter of figuring out what kind of service you need to run, um, what kind of frequency, what the main constraints are. Uh, do you expect a very large tidal peak? Um, what uh, do you, do you need to mix speeds? Um, what line characteristics is the line mostly single track? Some lines are just overbuilt because maybe they were built for a different traffic. Maybe they were built in an hour, and people did not realize that you could do crazy levels of uh, single track and still come out ahead. And so, um, and, and then you get a freebie. So the, um, so it's always what kind of service you're trying to run, what the, like, um, so it's, it's always about this kind of integrated planning where you're thinking, okay, here we need more infrastructure, here we don't. Um, you all, I mean, and by the way, you can absolutely use this method to do, to do zero, to do short term zero concrete time tables. And you can, Completely do this with like say okay what service should the MBTA run tomorrow? You can make the time table for that. I mean the I mean you figure out the I mean you need to use different levels of uh, uh, acceleration and so on. If it's diesel, um, you need to take into account much lower levels of reliability for a diesel, but you can still do that. Um, it's just and you can even try to do optimize timetable either way and then see the gains from electrification or the gains from high platforms. So um, so this is kind of how you cry on the timetables. Now uh, it's actually the normal I won't say it, I've been doing this so long but no, I usually do I usually try to do two hour videos. So this I think is a natural good point to stop and ask people if you have any questions about this or any comments. Um, if there aren't any, let's try to end this after two hours of recording. It's an hour fifty-one right now. Uh, if there are, I mean, you can go into the whenever. From what is the Boston response? Define Boston. Um, do you mean in power Boston? Um, the answer is that it depends. Um, the so the governor. Let's be more. Let's use the correct term. The thankfully outgoing governor said he's not going to run for re-election. Essentially, the Republican Party hates him because he. Uh, wins elections, uh, not only that, but in Massachusetts, and the way he wins elections in Massachusetts is by being uh, do-nothing. Uh, and the way his response to our proposal in the past has been so cool. It's all governed by pilot, for example. So the so what we had this night bus proposal in 2017 that he just, the, that he and his political appointee, um, a guy who had uh, parachuted from failing to turn around and forgetting which private I think General Motors, maybe. Uh, 
um, kept asking us for data on things that, uh, which is just proof of uh, proof of work. And uh, then, uh, and then when we had this eight bus line system, they somehow reduced it to one, and they made the one bus meander. And the, yeah. so the response of the governor has always been very cold because the governor never thinks in terms of any kind of coordination and any kind of long term commitment. It's the only commitments are to cutting taxes, cutting spending. Um, commitment to any kind of long-term investment to him is bad. Um, and this is how we win the Massachusetts we being do nothing, but also, for example, not randomly saying that immigrants are dirty people. Um, Larry Hogan is a little bit similar. I mean, except also racist. Like, Larry Hogan is a racist baker. Maybe personally, I mean, if there is a racism scandal about him, I don't know. Um, unfortunately for... Uh, his career, unfortunately for the people of Massachusetts, uh, he is in a weird spot because uh, to maybe win elections in Massachusetts, he needs to, and so is Larry Hogan, needs to, uh, they, they both need to kind of distinguish themselves from a national party that mostly aims to uh, uh, shoot uh, protesters. Uh, and uh, so, the, um, so, for example, neither of them endorsed Trump in uh, no, neither of them even endorsed Trump. I don't mean that they said, oh yeah, I voted Trump, but let's face it, Biden won the election. No, they um, said that they're not going to endorse Trump, that they're going to not vote for him or something. And so the party hates him as a result, so they can't... So, so I'm not sure about Hogan, but Baker, people were saying they was not going to win a primary, and he didn't want to run as an independent. So this is where he's leaving. Like, he's not termed out. Like, they're not term out. He just, he's not going... Um, I do not know what the likely successor again, a woman named Maura Healy, um, is is going to do. Uh, my my understanding is that she's a very generic Democrat, but which, I mean, I don't know. Like, I don't know where. I mean, so so I, so so the answer is that I don't know what's going to happen. Um, like, it, it that will run mildly competently. We're just appointing TM's exec, aka Jared Johnson, as. Minister of Transport, like Secretary of Transportation, um, but they don't think that way. They're going to find a random power broker. The legislature is kind of an odd entity. The, the, so because the legislature is single party, and it's it's not single party in that one party keeps like the Tories think of themselves as a single party government because they think that if they don't lo- if they don't win the election, it's because of weirdos of creeps and weirdos kind of like said they were here, but they recognize that there's an opposition party and they should like band together as Tories or as said um, and maybe even rally behind their own leaders and their own policies even. The dementia tax or the six euros per um, FFP2 mask uh, that retails at Aldi for a euro fifty, and so the um, and, and so the options in Massachusetts are like like fifty five percent or something. They're like such a huge super majority that they don't think like a party. They think like local interests. So a lot of the situation, so a lot of the issues when trying to persuade them at the level of this is what it's good for your district, as opposed to this is why it's like um, progressive policy in general. Um, it's also, I think, it's been an issue with DMB laws that they, as I understand it, DMB laws, I don't remember where, I think it was Virginia. Um, or like Virginia, Minnesota were trying to do this. Um, because they had small Democratic majority. Minnesota might still have it. Virginia just lost it in the election. Um, so it's Democrats who think like Democrats, whereas in California, which is the origin of this, the Democrats think like a representative from a random suburb, and if it's very local like that, then, it's, then you're representing the sort of people who can show up at a meeting to yell at you, and, um, and it's not going to be people who are animated by any kind of national partisan concerns because it's all the same party, so it's going to be... Um, the sort of Karens who uh, have the leisure to go at, uh, to go yell at you at three in the afternoon on a weekday, um, and this is where you're getting a lot of name Now in Massachusetts, um, so, so in Massachusetts, a lot of it has been about local things. Like here's how it's good for your district. Um, my understanding is that a lot of the funding that has been uh, sought for uh, modernization has been uh, kind of a matter of. Uh, 
specific of deals between um, specific representatives regarding specific district issues. Um, but that's my understanding from outside. Like, I'm not the person doing like any kind of legislative advocacy for this. I'm, I I write timetables and I uh, write like the prose that explains how the timetables are generated and what needs to be done to to get to them. That's like my role in in, in the entire process. And as of late, meetings uh, make bigoted statements against people who suffer from low-functioning allies. Um, like, I try to be tolerant. I try to be really tolerant of, let's say, straight people, native Germans, uh, of, uh, um, uh, of people on the Allison spectrum, but in very specific cases, I try to, like, in very specific cases, like, trying to be tolerant does not necessarily work and you need to, like, draw a line. Um, th does that answer your question, Warren? Like, I, I, I know I didn't fully answer it because there are certain things that I don't know, but this is my best understanding of the, of the situation with the Tampa proposals. Like it's, again, it's, it's a role that kind of assumes that the state actually has a long-term vision and doesn't is, is a big problem. And again, some of it is Charlie Baker's fault. Um, but again, I do not, I do not know whether Maura Healy um, is going to have that vision. Again, I, it's, it's, I, and I'm not saying it's a kind of a, I don't know is an, uh, and I'm not saying I don't know in the sense of, Oh, she's probably about it. Thing is, I do not know. All I know is her name is Maura Healy. I think she's the state attorney general, maybe. Maura Healy. Yes. Literally everything I know about her is this and that she's uh, planning to run for governor and is the front runner. Uh, this is the entirety of what I know of. Uh, of Healy. Um, I have no idea how popular she is. I have no idea how less strong she is. I have no idea anything. Um, so, um, I mean, I, I, I hope that like she will have that kind of vision, but again, I do not know whether she will. Um, I know that in, in New York, Kathy Hochul, 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 Kathy Hochul, and it was being kind of tardy with, uh, with with this. I mean, I mean, she threatened a lot of really bad Cuomoisms, um, but as I understand it, she still is wedded to rather bad ideas of commuter rail staffing. But also, New York does not have transit matters, um, and Meth and Kathy Hochul is very much not a vision person. She's a return to normal and not have the governor actively murder seniors. Uh, kind of person. Uh, by the way, are there any other questions about this? Either about like the Massachusetts issue specifically, or about general things? By the way, Warner, I mean, just to make it very clear, I have a bunch of close, I mean, not that many close friends, but I mean, some of them are straight, and some of them are holistic. I mean, they're high-functioning holistic, but I mean, I, I'm very close to a bunch of holistic people. I mean, I don't, I'm not, like, anti-holistic. Think about something very specific about, um, about, like, so about hyper-focus and, um, and what it means for, for training. Um, um, for grain planning, that's all. Yeah, I want to do two hours, like like flat two hours of recording, but uh, I'm gonna give people a little more time to type questions if they have any because there's always going to be lag. 
Um, we even saw the lag a little bit though when um, that is correct. When Ethan was saying that is correct about things that we're saying about Healy and disappeared in the screen shortly after I'd already um, clicked through about her being Attorney General. I mean, if there, are no, if there are no further questions, then we can end this. Thank you all for watching. I will upload. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, I've already uploaded, I guess. Um, and I will see you again, uh, hopefully in a week, with another video on a topic DVD. Ciao, ciao. Uh, ciao, ciao.